So hi everyone, um, welcome to Mac seminar. My name is Sophia and I know that the name up here on here would be Michelle, who's my manager, but due to personal reasons, um, she couldn't attend the seminar. So today I'll be the one who hosts this seminar with Jenny. Um, so today we'll be hosting the seminar with Jenny Wong, who is a clinical psychologist regarding the topic of malingering in IMEs and assessments in general. Um, so just a pre-profile of Jenny, um, she is a clinical psychologist with 20 years experience in medical, legal and fitness of duty assessments, clinical assessments and treatment of psychological conditions and adolescent mental health. Um, she spent much of the last 15 years in corporate health, providing a broad range of clinical psychological service, including clinical, cognitive and intellectual assessments and treatment for the full range of clinical presentations, including anxiety disorders, depression, um, PTSD, and trauma symptoms in both adults and adolescents. Um, she's currently the lead psychologist consulting to the Australian Federal Police um, Psychological Service. And um, prior to this current consulting work, um, she was also employed for 13 years with Health Services Australia, um, where she was a part of senior multidisciplinary team to provide a changing range of clinical services, including individual and group treatment as well. Um, so we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you have any questions, please leave it in the chat box or wait until the end after Jenny has finished her presentation. So over to you, Jenny. Thanks for that, Sophia. Thanks for that. Um, I might just get started because um, we've got a, a, a bit of information um, to get through. I did present this previously as a one hour um, uh, presentation. And so I've cut that down. Um, so if there's anything that you uh, require in terms of uh, clarification or further information, um, or even any uh, references, um, please leave that to the end. I'm very happy to, um, to elaborate at that time or to send you um, any additional uh, information or clarification or any uh, references that I have used. Um, and so, like I said, I, I, I have cut this down from a one hour talk to uh, 30 minutes today, so I will get started. Um, let me just get to, okay. So in order to share screen, I'm going to go here. Okay, um, can everybody see that? It's the uh, presentation notes that you will get a copy of at the end, but is everybody able to see that? Just um, put your hand up on the um, screen if you, if you can't, because I'm not able to see. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Sophia. Um, so this talk is about um, malingering and the term gets thrown around a lot, particularly in forensic or workers' comp or medico-legal settings. And um, what I want to do today is to unpack that, um, provide a definition, um, the medical definition of that, um, the prevalence. Uh, a lot of the data is um, American, but we do have some Australian data there, which is not very, not, not dissimilar. Um, some of the clinical presentations that are um, that are common in uh, where malingering might take place. Um, some of the detection strategies, so some of the things that trip them up, uh, trip up any um, people who might be malingering. Um, some of the common psychological tests that are used to detect um, or to make an assessment or observation. Um, as well as, of course, uh, observation and clinical um, and the clinical interview itself. I'd like to discuss some of the ethical concerns because obviously it's, an, it's a quite a contentious topic. It's not something you can um, easily um, raise or easily uh, accuse somebody of. So there are obviously moral and ethical concerns there. The first thing, this is something um, when I started um, as a young a psychologist doing Centrelink assessments of all things, 
it was in relation to the disability support pension and um, obviously there is a lot of uh, obviously there's a lot of um, um, real presentations genuine presentations there um, but at the same time um, our job was to consider whether somebody was exaggerating uh, their condition for that purpose. Um, there was a doctor at the time who was training me who said, believe nothing, consider everything. And then um, a couple of years later, I saw this in print somewhere. So I thought, oh, that was not his, um, you know, not, it wasn't originated from him. But, uh, you know, it, it was, it's, it is something that, I, that has stuck to me every time I do a medico legal assessment. Um, so malingering is detecting, um, reliably detecting malingered mental illness is quite complex. Um, it requires the psychologist or the psychiatrist to consider collateral data beyond the patient interview, obviously. So collateral information comes from sources such as school trans transcripts, if they provide that, um, mental health treatment and evaluation records, uh, medical records, arrest records, police police records, um, or if the person was in the forensic setting, then correctional records as well, and interviews with um, people who've had contact um, with that person. The definition of malingering um, malingering is not a mental illness, so it's not diagnosed. We don't diagnose a person with malingering or as malingering, um, but it is observed or detected. So we can say that, um, you know, well, I'll get into some of the wording that we can use um, to, to convey that somebody is not giving their best effort, um, but we don't use it as a diagnosis. According to the DSM-5, um, it has a V code, which just means that it's it's um, it's described as the intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms motivated by external incentives, um, such as avoiding military duty, avoiding um, work, um, obtaining financial compensation, um, evading criminal prosecution. Um, or obtaining drugs. So all of these things are external incentives and um, that's, that's mainly where um, the malingering presents because it is um, when people it, uh, intentionally produce um, or exaggerate their symptoms of those gains. Um, first up, I mean, this is this is this slide is quite clinical in that it may you know it won't, it won't apply to lawyers or um, insurers, but it is something to be aware of. Um, if uh, for a clinician, um, some of the differential diagnoses we might have to consider. For example, we we need to rule these things out before we can say we think somebody um, is engaging in malingering behaviour. Um, so. It may, on the surface, um, look like a, a factitious disorder, for example, the Munchausen um, syndrome, um, which is where a person's motivation is to assume the sick role. So that's not for incentive or financial gain. It's the person has that mental health condition where they actually um, want to assume the sick role and want to be uh, sick, or the Munchausen by proxy is where a person, where a person, usually the parent um, of a person, um, fabricates symptoms to for, for, for whatever gain, um, and it's not always financial. So um, sympathy, attention, those sorts of things. So they're factitious disorders, and um, it may present um, as as malingering, but we need to rule that out. Conversion disorders as well, um, and um, somatome, uh, somatoform disorders um, are the int intentional production of symptoms. Um, and, and of course, there's um, usually um, financial gain around that as well. But these are very, um, can be quite blurred. Uh, and so the, the idea in a clinical, disorder, clinical assessment would be to uh, make those differential diagnoses. Um, 
one way that a clinician might be able to make that distinction is that in malingering, in, which is in contrast to the conversion disorder, um, symptom relief is not obtained by suggestion or hypnosis. So with conversion disorder, it might respond to um, those sorts of treatment, uh, uh, treatment um, modalities. Um, look, malingering is not an all or nothing phenomenon. It exists on, on different levels. Um, these are the different types of malingering that uh, present in, in an assessment. Um, there's invention, which is uh, just creating or making up symptoms out of, out of thin air where none exist. There's perseveration, which means describing symptoms that previously occurred and may not now. Um, there, <coughs> sorry, there's exaggeration. Um, which is um, amplifying or magnifying symptom severity. So th this is a common presentation, um, particularly when I was doing um, disability support pensions where, um, uh, you know, they, I guess the applicant knew that things were checkable um, with their treating doctor. And so um, exaggeration was the common present uh, malingering presentation because they might um, magnify and, and say that they're much worse than they are as opposed to making up a symptom altogether. Um, and transference, which is um, attri uh, attributing real symptoms to a false cause. So some common motives of malingerers, um, and, and um, so in this box you'll see there's, um, uh, I guess, two polar opposites, which is one to avoid pain or one to seek pleasure. Um, so the avoidance category might be you might malinger to avoid arrest, um, to avoid criminal prosecution, um, or in, in some countries, conscription to the military. So we've all seen um, media stories of um, perhaps celebrities who get into trouble and then uh, pull the mental health card. Is, is I mean, it's horrible to say, but, um, you know, that, that's something where you might um, consider that, that, um, that malingering might be at play. One of those levels that we talked about before um, because of uh, the, the avoidance of something negative. Um, and then there's the um, to seek something positive, which is to seek pleasure. So a malingerer might do so um, to obtain drugs or a controlled substance um, for, 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 for free things. Um, or, of course, um, in this setting, the workers' compensation or disability benefits for um, any sort of alleged psychological injury. And I just say psychological because... Um, because I'm a psychologist, there is, of course, um, a level of, of malingering in the or, or exaggeration in medical or physical um, presentations as well, which I'm obviously not qualified to discuss. Um, moving along to the prevalence. Um, so this is in terms of a... Um, uh, 2002 study, um, there are some more updated um, statistics around here, but uh, this was a, a very large and influential study that looked at over 33,000 uh, clinical reports uh, that demonstrated uh, probable malingering and symptom exaggeration. So these are the numbers here. In personal injury cases, um, malingering had presented in 29% of cases, so almost a third, and then again a third in disability cases. Certainly I did see that when I did the Centrelink um, disability claims. Um, in criminal cases, um, 19%, and in uh, medical cases, 8%. So this is something that is quite um, a lot of... Um, um, all, all parties are, are quite aware of it, that from everything from the, um, the lawyers down to the, uh, the, the, the clinical assessors. Um, in addition to that, specifically for their personal injury cases, um, I looked at, there was a study um, 
uh, on members of the American Board of Clinical Neuro Neuropsychologists that it, who estimated that obviously a degree of um, symptom exaggeration occurred in 39% of mild head injury cases and 30% of disability assessments, which is what we mentioned here. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit more into the cognitive um, deficit, the cognitive malingering, because that's an area where um, obviously you can't see what's going on inside someone's head post uh, brain injury. Um, and it is an area where malingering um, takes place in terms of um, things like um, uh, memory or concentration um, complaints. Um, and, and cognitive deficits are a very common claimed disability. Um, and some neuro, neuropsychologists estimate it, it affects up to um, 33 to 60% of all um, claims there. <clears throat> um, evaluating malingering in cognitive and memory exager, uh, examinations is a very complex topic and it's in fact requires a more comprehensive review and a separate workshop, which I've also presented in before. And that in that presentation, I would go into the types of um, cognitive or neuropsychological um, tests um, where, uh, and, and how to detect malingering in those tests. <clears throat> Uh, chronic pain is the other one. So chronic pain um, is also a, an area where malingering is, is quite common. Um, uh, so feigning illness in order to receive disabilities, you can see there, is, is very, very high. It's just across the board in a lot of um, uh, medical legal settings. Um, the highest rates of malingering are found in forensic settings. Uh, it's been found time and time again for, for quite a few decades. Um, estimates of malingering in forensic populations um, reach um, about um, 17 to 20%. Um, however, the, the, the accuracy, and across all of these settings, the accuracy of such estimates is, 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 um, is quite difficult and, and, and may be questionable because successful malingerers are not detected and, and, and therefore are not included within that estimate. Just go back there. Um, the use of the term malingering um, can be highly um, uh, uh, prejudicial to, to people, obviously. The stigma attached to the term far exceeds that of um, other phrases, such as more, more sort of um, appropriate phrases to use, uh, you know, unreliable information or inaccurate picture or inconsistent picture. So those sorts of um, terminology is, is much more um, acceptable and, and um, for, for all parties than to say that somebody is malingering. Um, well, this is where, of course, collateral information is critical um, as, a, as a backup for, for anybody who is wishing to um, make the claim that somebody is exaggerating their, uh, their, their, their injury or their symptom, symptomatology. Um, decision makers can be easily biased by conclusion um, that the examinee is faking a mental disorder. Um, or by manipulation or lying about symptoms to avoid a punishment. So once that term is thrown in there, um, any person who's on the other side and making decisions about that, whether it's um, the insurers or whether it's um, work um, uh, employees, uh, sorry, employers um, or rehab people who are trying to return somebody to work, um, sort of, you know, stick to that term. So really, a clinician must be very careful in applying that term because um, of adverse um, outcomes, such as the denial of treatment, um, which would be terrible if somebody was not um, malingering, um, or, a, 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 you know, offence um, enhancement. So um, who is malingering? Um, according to the DSM-5, malingering should be st strongly suspected um, if there's any combination of these uh, um, are noted. So a medico-legal context of presentation, so 
um, if the person is referred by a lawyer to the clinician for examination um, or where there is a marked discrepancy between the person's claimed stress or disability um, uh, and the objective findings. Also where uh, there is an observed uh, lack of cooperation during the diagnostic um, evaluation um, and in complying with the prescribed uh, treatment regimen. So um, if somebody is saying they um, are extremely depressed or extremely um, suffering from um, nightmares or, or anything like that with a PTSD, um, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a clear lack of cooperation um, with, with treatment uh, recommendations. Um, of course, there is uh, treatment um, non-compliance for other reasons, um, but this is just one consideration. Um, and the DSM also highlight um, that the presence of a, a, a antisocial personality disorder is um, often associated with malingering. So these are some of the um, common diagnostic um, categories that are, um, sorry, malingering by diagnostic category. Some common presentations include, um, in, in, for mental health anyway, for uh, PTSD, um, psychotic disorders and cognitive deficits, um, which is whether it be an acquired brain injury such as um, um, a, a, a traumatic um, car accident or stroke, um, or other incidents such as um, intellectual disability. So PTSD is probably, pro probably represents um, the greatest malingering challenge of our time um, because it has a definable and diagnostically um, essentially um, a clear cause um, which can lead to compensation litigation and, and various other claims for assistance. So it's something that um, we, we do see a lot of. Um, I do have some, in my notes, I do have um, information regarding um, what are the main limitations and challenges for a clinician um, assessing for malingering within the PTSD presentation. So I'll um, send that along with um, the, these notes, uh, the, the presentation slides um, for Sophia to um, distribute at the end of this session, um, because that's quite important not to dismiss the person's presentation and to make a thorough assessment about that. Um, I just want to talk about some of the common um, or the um, presentations that might suggest malingering. This is with um, psychotic disorders. Now, psychotic disorders, um, you would think are quite easy to uh, malinger or quite easy to, um, to misrepresent. So, for example, um, there is, there's been, you know, numerous... Um, uh, movies made about, um, for example, you know, hearing voices or, um, but, and I'll also later we'll talk about how these people trip up when they're, when they're exaggerating or fabricating some of these symptoms. So some of the, um, th these are the uncommon presentations. So when you see this, it just means, look, this, this, this is not a normal or a typical presentation for psychosis. So, so when they say that the hallucinations are continuous, this is quite uncommon for people who genuinely experience psychosis. It is not continuous. It's, it, it, um, it, it, it's not there all the time. Um, or they might say that, um, uh, the voices use stilted language. Um, the patient uses no strategies to diminish the hallucinations. Um, so in a, in a typical genuine presentation, the person um, might be doing all they can to, to stop that, um, whether that be self-medication with drugs or other things, um, distraction via other means. Um, they are trying to diminish that. And when somebody is presenting where they're making no effort to stop that or some or, or uh, complaining about any of these other uh, presentations, it does suggest a level of, of exaggeration or malingering. 
um, or that the pa patient's um, conduct is inconsistent with delusions. So they've read about delusions, they know what that is, but the way that they outwardly behave may not be consistent from a clinical perspective on how a person with delusions genuinely should behave. The other thing is that the person is quite eager to discuss their delusions, and this is not a normal or common presentation with a person who is genuinely um, experiencing psychosis. Um, these are some clues um, for the clinician during interview. So, for example, they might um, uh, they might give a clear and articulate explanation of being confused. So obviously the, the inconsistency is there. You know, they're saying that they're confused. They're saying they've got brain fog. They're saying, they're saying they've got, um, 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 you know, confusion in their head and yet they can give, uh, they can provide a clear and articulate explanation of that. Um, or they give conflicting versions. Obviously that's, that's, that's quite clear. Um, so um, these are some other um, inconsistencies. They might um, allege having um, active auditory or visual hallucinations and yet not show any evidence of being um, distracted at all or might be able to sit through a two-hour interview um, and you observe them um, being quite lucid and quite um, um, attentive. Um, I might just um, move on there because I'll talk about the test results as well, which is that last box, the last slide, the, the last um, line there. So some of the detection strategies, um, they, uh, they might report quite, uh, symptoms that are very rare. So clinically rare, statistically rare um, in, the, in the genuine uh, clinical um, population for that for that group, um, or they might um, endorse symptoms that um, are indiscriminate, or they uh, don't normally go together. Um, so it's not really a, certain presentations have symptoms that are clustered or are, um, seem to go together, um, and they might just sort of pick and choose from a list, um, or very obvious symptoms. Um, so uh, overplaying that or, or, um, or um, being, being overly exaggerated. Um, improbable symptoms, um, extreme or very unusual severity, particularly when that doesn't match any collateral um, information. Um, and like I said, un un unlikely symptom combinations um, or um, they make mistakes in the stereotypes. Um, and of course, clearly that where there's a reported or observed, um, reported versus observed symptom um, clash there. So where do, how do we detect that? Where do malingerers trip, trip up? Um, they, they may have inadequate or incomplete knowledge of the mental illness that they are faking. Um, numerous um, clinical factors suggest um, malingering. So malingerers are more likely to um, quite eagerly um, put forward their illness, whereas patients with genuine schizophrenia, for example, are often reluctant to discuss their symptoms. So they're not, um, you know, they're not shouting it out at the rooftops for everybody to, to know about. Um, malingerers may attempt to take control of the interview um, because they've got set answers and they've got uh, they, they want to get that out um, and or behave in a, an intimidating or hostile manner. Um, they may accuse the psychologist of inferring that they are faking. So um, that's putting them up in that's sort of creating a, a, um, um, a defense um, mechanism straight up. Um, such behavior is, is rare in genuinely um, psychotic or, or, or schizophrenic individuals, for example. Um, malingerers often believe that faking intellectual deficits. Um, in addition to psychotic symptoms, may make them um, appear more um, believable. For example, a man who had completed several years of college um, 
uh, alleged that he didn't know the, you know, the colours of the American flag. This was actually an example that was provided in a um, case study I read about, um, obviously, from the, the states. So um, malingering versus effort. Um, effort is assessed, effort we can assess via some psychological um, or psychometric um, questionnaires, which I'll go through, or tests, which I'll go through in a minute. Um, uh, basically, there is no litmus test for, for malingering. Um, it's not something you can um, have any definite screening for. Um, and no single test item or, um, or fact or anything like that um, uh, rules, out maling rules in or rules out malingering. This, uh, one of the strongest uh, in indicators may be um, cognitive test performance that is significantly less accurate than would occur by chance. So I want to get into that. And I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen um, the cognitive tests that are designed specifically for catching out um, effort, uh, reduced effort. Um, and of course, malingering must be included in the differential diagnosis in any um, assessment there. So the assessment, um, when I would do an assessment um, for um, in a medico legal context, I would obviously take a clinical history, um, collect any collateral data, as um, uh, with that, that may include calling around, um, you know, um, and, and also getting interviews with um, uh, key um, people in the person's life, including treating uh, treatment providers as, and, and family members, um, and then provide some or conduct some psychometric testing. Um, so obviously with the interview, um, if you suspect that somebody's exaggerating their symptoms, um, I, I obviously would keep my suspicions to myself and conduct an ob objective um, evaluation um, because that's, that obviously is going to hold more water than, than if I um, just said this person looked like they were not putting in the, their best effort. Obviously, you don't want to put that person, um, uh, uh, you know, on, on, on the other straight up. Um, patients are likely to become defensive if if you show annoyance or, you know, encourage, like if you just feel that what they're saying is incredible um, and putting them on guard, um, which will decrease, of course, the rapport um, and, and, and also decrease any ability to um, uncover any other evidence of, of malingering. Um, so I've got some notes there as well regarding um, how to conduct an interview fairly um, but also in a way that um, 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 does not put the person um, off guard or, or make them feel defensive. Um, so, yeah, cognitive malingering, um, which is obviously one of the types of malingering as well, refers to um, feigning a deficit, pretending to be less intelligent um, or less able um, than one actually is. Obviously, that presents in, in disability claims um, or um, claims of loss of um, function. Um, so some of the tests that are, uh, these are um, tests that are used quite uh, frequently within a um, neuropsychological or a cognitive test battery. Um, the TOM, which I'll get into in a minute, is the test of, maling uh, test of memory malingering, T-O-M-M. -M. Um, it is never, um, it, it, when we write the reports, we never actually uh, um, write out the whole test uh, label or name because it gives away what the test is. So it's just simply called the TOM, always. Um, funnily enough, um, the TOM is written by a, was developed by a psychologist called Tom Tombo, which is quite funny because, um, you know, he just owns the whole TOM name. Um, now, in terms of the... Um, 
when we when we're talking about uh, cognitive um, um, impairment and and malingering. Um, we are talking about things like um, whether a person is um, doing, they might do well on one test and then not on another, whereas those tests are normally demonstrated to be highly um, um, correlated or, um, you know, have, have impact on each other. Um, the other thing is obviously it's quite easy um, to underachieve on an IQ test um, simply by giving in, in, uh, incorrect answers um, um, or by saying, I don't know. So a careful review of the person's adaptive functioning um, is also quite, um, is very, is critical. So the DSM for a diagnosis of um, intellectual disability includes IQ as well as um, their adaptive functioning. So you cannot use one um, test to determine a person's intellectual um, disability. Um, so there are two strategies to fake on a cognitive test. One is excessive impairment and the other is um, to look at unexpected um, patterns. Um, I don't have a um, an image of what the TOM would look like here, the, the TOM test, but essentially it's a test of, um, it's a test of, um, it looks like it's quite demanding. It looks like it's very hard, but in fact, um, it, it's quite easy. And um, it, it, it's even um, robust against real or um, genuine neuropsychological presentations such as um, stroke or even dementia. Um, so what it is, is um, for, for those of you who, who may not know, it's um, you, you show a person um, two items on a, on a page um, and you flip, there's 50 pages and you, you go through um, all of that. And then at the end, it's the, so that's the, um, that's the, the stage where you uh, ask them to try and memorise all of the pictures and it looks very hard. And then later on, you show them a picture where they are asked to discriminate and asked to say which picture they saw in that. And even by chance, um, if they were guessing, um, a person by chance might get 50% correct. Um, so if somebody's hovering around the 20% correct, you know that um, the, the test publishers say that that is where we would um, um, consider that uh, they're not putting in their best effort. So um, you might want to have a go at this. This is the uh, 15 item test. So I want you to look at that for um, 10 seconds. This is what I would actually be doing with the person. So I'll ask them to look at it for 10 seconds and then I take it away and I'll say, look, uh, I want you to reproduce that on a piece of paper, exactly what you saw. So that's the Ray um, 15 item. It is um, a very quick and easy test to include in a battery um, to assist with any determination of ex exaggeration of symptoms. Um, so the Ray... Um, is um, if you get anybody who got less than nine out of 15 there, if you actually did do the test, um, you're probably malingering. So that's, um, that's a quick and easy test um, to, to look at, um, to just insert within a battery of tests um, in relation to a person's um, likelihood of malingering. Um, reporting is very important. Um, so um, you must be familiar with the field of research before you can take this on and, and make any um, claims that the person is not um, putting in their best effort. Um, one difficult question is how to feed such information back to the individual. Tested. They might ask for feedback. They might ask for their test results. So um, if, if, that does come up. You don't want to, you, obviously we cannot say to the person, we think you're malingering. We use other terms um, to discuss inconsistencies um, in that. 
Um, but obviously it's clear to other, other decision makers. Some of the ethical concerns, and this is coming up to the end of um, the presentation, um, to what extent do mental health professionals have um, an ethical obligation to inform um, any claimants or examinees about efforts to detect malingering? Like, do we tell them we're about to test them for that? Um, because from an ethical perspective, is it unethical to mislead an examinee in an attempt to assess effort? That, that's an open-ended question for which I have no exact answer. Uh, it's just something for us to consider. Um, because, for example, that test that I just um, showed you on the screen, I would not say to somebody, I'm using this to, to assess your effort. Um, and is that ethical to not disclose or share that? Um, ethical guidelines for um, psychology um, stress the importance of honestly explaining the valuation to the person to be assessed. Um, and they do have a right to know the purpose of the assessment. So um, I guess it comes down to each assessor being able to determine the appropriate level of detail in which an evalu evaluation or technique is explained um, without using um, any of those terms. And like I said, for example, with Tom, we would not put, um, in fact, even on the test booklet, it doesn't say it's the test of memory malingering. It's just simply called the Tom. So some conclusions, um, the assessment of malingering in clinical or forensic settings um, should be comprehensive um, and should never rely solely on a single measure due to the potential consequences associated with any misclassification. Um, in addition to any um, standard clinical interview, the um, acquisition of any collateral information um, to verify the, any veracity or any claims um, is, is, is essential. Um, and we want that backup for ourselves as well. Um, our, law, our knowledge in this area is still quite limited um, and, and conclusions need to be drawn quite conservatively. Um, but remembering that the evidence, um, that evidence of exaggeration does not necessarily rule out um, the presence of a neurological or psychological condition. So that comes to the, I've just come to the end of that. So I'm going to stop sharing there and move along to questions because I know we've gone over time. Um, yep, yeah, thank you, Jenny, um, for a really great presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do come forward and unmute yourself or please put it in the chat box and we'll check. Thank you. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, hi, Luke. I just had a quick question regarding if, if there is signs um, when someone gets assessed that there is malingering, what, what's the next step thereafter? Like, what should the next step be um, in order to you know, either verify or to knock out the chances that they are malingering? Um, do you mean, uh, sorry, what's your, what's your background? Are you an assessor? I both a compensation lawyer. You're a compensation lawyer, yeah. I would get a, I would get an assessment. Um, I would get an independent assessment done um, uh, on on that person. So either with a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist um, who who has some experience in that field, um, because you want some objective data around that as well. So such as with the psychometric tests, um, and and then as well as part of the assessment might be to to. Um, gather that collateral information from either, either school reports or uh, you know past medical reports um, to to because um, a lot of the time um, time frames and um, you know um, the the way that a, a, um, a condition might um, develop over time um, that that gives us some clues as well so um, I would I would um, suggest a, an independent um, clinical assessment if if the malingering has kind of arisen um yep. in the independent assessment would it then go towards psychometric testing is that once you've got the collateral evidence it needs to go towards that kind of system i think that would be the most um objective um way to present that issue thank you thanks
Yeah, thanks Luke for the question. Does anyone else have any questions? Please do come forward. So um, would it be helpful to have the, um, the notes that I used behind um, these slides um, for people? And if anyone wants any uh, references from any of those stats or any of the um, um, information I provided, I'd be happy to forward that to Sophia as well. That'd be excellent, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks Jenny. Yeah, if you could forward that to me and then I'll forward it to the attendees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yes, yeah, so I guess there'll be no more questions. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you everyone for joining and thank you Jenny for a really great presentation. Um, Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. See you. Bye.